you've been a lifer over at Therapy Beam, haven't you? I sure have been. Isn't that bananas? I'm like the only person left who's worked 30 years at a company. This is Bourbon Pursuit, the official podcast of bourbon, bringing to you the best in news, reviews, and interviews with people making the bourbon whiskey industry happen. And I'm one of your hosts, Kenny Coleman. Now, I'll come right out and say it. This episode was never intended to be a two-parter. But once I sat down with our guest, I couldn't bring myself to hit the stop button because I wanted to keep hearing the stories that she had to tell. Kathleen D. Benedetto is the Senior Director of Premium Seed Brands now at Beam Suntory, and she has nearly a 30-year career span there. And one of her first jobs was working alongside Booker No. And this is really where a lot of those stories that we want to capture as a part of this podcast really come to light. She traveled the country with Booker and learned what it took to market and find audiences for their premium, uncut, unfiltered small batch whiskey that at one point it was really hard to sell. And she had to help people find that really that, that core essence of the brand. And she helped not only just Booker's, but also Knob Creek and Baker's grow from its infant stages. And this is even before Booker's even had a box to what we see today. And Kathleen shares her fondest memories of working alongside Booker and the No family and how that set her down a path to be inducted into the Bourbon Hall of Fame and also have her own Booker's batch named after her. But make sure you stick around next week for part two as well. But with that, cheers, everybody. Enjoy this week's episode. And now here's Fred Minnick with Above the Char. I'm Fred Minnick, and this is Above the Char. This week's idea comes from someone on Twitter, at ZSmooth19, that's Z-E-E-E underscore Smooth19. How long will this whiskey shortage last, and is the boom in whiskey or staffing shortages? So, first of all, There is an enormous boom in whiskey. You don't have to look very far to see empty shelves, and you don't have to look very far to see people adding on to their facilities so they can, you know, make more whiskey for the future. The primary issue right now is glass. So there's not enough glass being produced in in the major manufacturing areas to supply the demand for whiskey. And so you have Jack Daniels that has all this whiskey in the world, but it's sitting to be bottled because they're waiting for glass to be fulfilled. The next wave that will cause a shortage are white oak barrels. So while bourbon has to go into new charred oak, it does not specify what kind of oak. The majority of it's coming from uh, white oak trees, Corcus Alba, for example, in the Appalachian uh, white oak forests. And this is a major concern because the the trees are not replenishing at a high enough rate. And so I think there's going to be a a definite discussion of what to do here. Now, the good news is the distilling industry is actually the most like forward thinking when it comes to white oak trees in that they are encouraging planting. They are donating money to like forestry areas. And so... The distilling industry is not causing this issue, folks. So if you, if I mean, well, you know, barrels, uh, that's an obvious one, but we're looking at things like construction. That's a big cause to this. Also, the the development of suburbia uh, cutting into some of the white oak regions. Uh, and also the fact that you, you, you just don't see, you know, large tracts of land with, with white oak anymore. So these this is getting depleted. So I think that's going to be a real major issue within the next decade. But, you know, the fact is, is that bourbon barrels are sustainable in that they are reused for up until like 80 to 100 years. So um, this is one where it's it's the biggest issue that I see coming down the pike. And bourbon is probably one of the more more focused on making sure those trees are growing, you know? So if you live in an area that you can uh, plant a tree, do so today and in 20 years, you know, hopefully it's, you know, bringing joy to your family. I love trees, but uh, that's going to do it for this week's episode. Hey, if you want to be like Z smooth on Twitter, hit me up on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or fredminnick.com and let me know your question until next week. Cheers. From their bar to yours, 
Chad and Sarah of the popular YouTube channel It's Bourbon Night bring you their favorite at-home old-fashioned mix with the new Elemental Elixir's Golden Hour Syrup. It's a custom-made syrup with notes of bold black tea, warm spices, and orange zest. All you need is your favorite whiskey and ice. No bitters needed. One bottle makes 16 drinks, so that's only $1 cocktail before you add your own whiskey. They can also be enjoyed in other cocktails or spirits, mocktails, coffee, tea, and anything you can think of. It's crafted locally in Lexington, Kentucky, and you can get your bottle now at whiskeyambitions.com. Ed Bly and Rising Tide Spirits are back again with a new release of Old Stubborn Bourbon. And this release of Old Stubborn is a premium hand marriage of 10, 11, and 12-year cask drink, barely filtered pot still bourbon. It comes in at a staggering 123.8 proof. And the flavoring grain for this one, which the last one was weeded, but this time it's now rye. Rich, sweet, and bold with a long finish that's sure to be another eye-opener. You can order online at Sealbox or TheBourbonConcierge.com. And you can even purchase in person at Revival Vintage Spirits and even now with very few select stores in Kentucky. You can get it now while you can, but be sure to do it because it's not going to last long. Do you ever pour yourself a bourbon, swirl it around, and then start struggling to come up with tasting notes? And perhaps you're also looking for a good Father's Day gift idea. Well, you can now solve both with a kit from Nose Your Bourbon. And unlike other nosing kits on the market, Nose Your Bourbon kits feature real ingredients for the most authentic aromas. You can smell real Tahitian vanilla bean instead of some synthetic aroma that's just made from chemicals. So head on over to noseyourbourbon.com and enter code BP10 for 10% off your order. Play Whiskey Wednesday Round 11, The Memory Game. Until June 26, each week you can win one of our 12 incredible grand prizes. Select two doors at checkout. And if they match on drawing night, you'll win that bottle. Not a match? No worries. You still score a Weller 12-year. Every $5 ticket gives you five chances to win, including four weekly bonus prizes. Get your tickets now at give270.org. Charitable Gaming License ORG 0002703. Always find what you love at Total Wine & More. With so many great bottles to choose from at the lowest price, it's easy to find your favorite Cabernet or a new single-barrel bourbon to try with some help from one of their friendly guides. And with every bottle comes the confidence of knowing you just found something amazing. With the lowest prices for over 30 years, find what you love and love what you find only at Total Wine & More. Curbside pickup and delivery available in most areas. Visit TotalWine.com to learn more. Spirits not sold in Virginia, North Carolina, drink responsibly, and be 21. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Bourbon Pursuit, the official podcast of bourbon. Kenny here today talking with an amazing guest that we've never had on the show before, but after going through and trolling LinkedIn, I was able to find a wealth of information, especially as we were sitting here chatting beforehand. I am really excited for everybody to kind of understand who our guest is and the impact she's had on the bourbon industry. It's somebody that's been around at Beam Suntory for almost three decades now. And that's longer than some master distillers have actually spent time at Beam. And it'll be interesting to kind of talk about how she's seen the face of Beam change, the brands change, the brands that she's helped build and kind of put out to market. And one of those we're going to hit on, which is a big one that rings home and rings a bell to every whiskey nerd out there, is Booker's Bourbon. So today on the show, we have Kathleen Di Benedetto. She is the Senior Director of Premium Seed Brands at Beam Suntory. She spent almost 30 years at Jim Beam. I think she's in year 28 or 29 right now. She was inducted into the Bourbon Hall of Fame in 2015. She was invited to join the exclusive Scotch Whiskey Society's Keeper of the Quay, where she's a membership chair and the secretary for the U.S. chapter. She did that back in 2007. She's also a member of the Senior Executive Committee of Women of the Vine and Spirits. And I think maybe even the biggest asterisk as of all this is that she actually has a Booker's Batch named after her called Kathleen's Bourbon. So Kathleen, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks for having me. Boy, I, I got to tape that for my mother so she can hear all those things. But it, it does. Uh, I'm super excited to talk to you about all the the crazy of my 30 years. This will be it'll be 30 years as of November 27th of this year. Awesome. That's it's crazy. We were talking about beforehand. It was like that's it's amazing to kind of see that growth into it because nobody spends that kind of time at a company. What was the what did you come into the company doing? 
Well, you know, it's funny that you ask that because I came into the company, I actually, uh, while am super young, started working with another company before Beam. And, uh, and my client was Amaretta Di Serono and Rumplemints. So I don't know if you recall. Oh, I, I can recall some Rumplemint shots back in college. I can yeah, recall so the, that. The Match the Tattoo campaign, that was mine. I'm so proud. So my client who worked on those brands moved over to Beam and she was working on De Kuyper. And I don't know if you know De Kuyper. They are, it's a cordial and that family has been making spirits since 1695 out of the Netherlands. And I came over to work on cactus juice and uh, peach tree and all of those crazy brands, Razzmatazz, Hot Dam. And uh, I came in to do the Cactus Juice Desert Volleyball Tournament. You can imagine an entire summer, 12 beaches, a camel. We brought a camel on a beach. Why not? We had several. Uh, we almost got arrested a couple times. We had a 25-foot blow-up cactus juice bottle on the beach uh, that kept falling over and hopefully, thank God, didn't hurt anybody. But we just lived the best life for a summer, narrowly, narrowly escaping uh, getting fired. But it was a really great experience. However, it left me wanting more. So I came over. I worked on that business. I don't know how that could leave you wanting more. That sounds like an all-American summer right there. Well, it was an all-American summer. But let me just tell you, it's a. it was a great tasting margarita schnapps cactus juice. It really was. But I think I gained 20 pounds <laughs> that summer just drinking all of these crazy shots and Every weekend we were on a different beach. And I know it, it sounds like a dream for a young person, but honestly, I was I was done by the end of that. I know how great the De Kuiper brand name was, and I felt like this wasn't doing what it needed to to honor the past legacy of that business. And it just so happened at that same time that I was doing that tournament, uh, that was my first year at Beam, I went to a tasting with Booker No. They had just introduced Booker's bourbon. Well, they had introduced Booker's to distributors back in the late 80s. Distributors got those as gifts for the holidays, and it was really, really well received. And Booker came into, into Deerfield, Illinois, which is where our offices were at that time, and he did a tasting. And he talked about the Beam family. He talked about his history. And that's when I realized, that's where I want to go. That's... That's the honor of history. That's bringing to life a legacy, right? A true legacy. So I stayed on Cactus Juice for one year, and then I understood that Booker was looking for a brand manager. Now, his business was tiny, just FYI. He, this idea of Booker's and the small batch bourbons, this was his legacy. So Jim Beam had Jim Beam bourbon. That was his legacy. Every Beam family member from 1795 up had brands that were their own. For David M., it was Old Tub. For Jim Beam, it was Colonel James B. Beam. And Booker had us a son. We call him Fred No, Big Fred. Um, he's the dad, and he has now a son, Little Fred. But Booker wanted his son to have something that was special, that was just brought on by his direct family. And how can Fred take that forward? So Booker came out with the small batch bourbon collection. I understood he was looking for a brand manager. And I, I asked if I could interview. I asked my boss and she said, well, sure, but there's not going to be any money associated with it. And if you do this, know that there is 50% of your time, you've got to be in the field selling. I'm like, I'm cool with that. I'm, I'm, I'm going to do this. So I, I interviewed with Booker and I interviewed with the head of marketing and Booker said, okay, you want to work on my brands? You have to know how to make whiskey. And my boss was like, you don't need to know how to make whiskey to market it. And Booker said, you know, horse feathers, but not that <laughs> word. It's, it's like you got a devil on one shoulder, an angel on the other. You don't know who to listen yeah, to. Yeah, yeah. Well, I knew I was going to listen to the, the patriarch of the family. That's for damn sure. I went back to my boss and I'm like, like, you know, he really... If I want this job, I, I'm going to have to go down to Kentucky and learn to make whiskey. We agreed to do this. 
And I agreed that to take a non-traditional marketing role. So in the past, I was doing all kinds of marketing plans and I was building promotions. In this case, it was all about learning the craft of whiskey to better understand how to talk about whiskey. He really felt like you could not express the truth of a brand unless you understood all the pieces that made it, including the people, which was really interesting. I'd never thought about it that way. And that I, I'm very fortunate that I was able to learn under him. I went down there. I knew that part of my job was going to be once I finished this, I needed to go into the field and sell this spirit. Now, if you recall, this time was uh, early 90s. And what was king? Vodka was king. You know, Grey Goose, the world's best tasting vodka, was what everybody wanted. And I would go into accounts and try to sell bookers. Like, excuse me, what's the proof? No. And so I understood the purpose of why I had to go down to make whiskey. Once I went down to make the whiskey, I would understand how each of these brands, Knob Creek, Baker's, Basil Hayden and Booker's are each distinctively different. And you can't understand that if you are marketing on the periphery, you know, if you're not looking at in depth. I mean, who would know that Booker's is straight from the barrel, uncut and unfiltered, which means there's no water ever added. I wouldn't understand that that meant something to flavor. I wouldn't understand that if you distill it a lower proof, you get more flavor, I wouldn't understand how much math I didn't know or didn't carry with me from high school when I tried to cut the proof. It was ridiculous. You know, I, the, it comes out of the barrel at, you know, 127. Okay, Kathleen, how are you going to get it down to 100 proof? I'm like, I called, I literally called my mother who worked at the high school who shared a room with the head of my algebra class. And I'm like, I need to talk to Mr. Lamos. I don't know how to do this calculation. And every night, after I would do that work, I'd have to come back and explain the calculations to Booker, and he'd have a test. I'd have a test at the dinner table. I cried. I think I cried about three times because I felt like I, I didn't know what I was doing. I, I wasn't sure this was the right decision. But looking back, I, you learn in conflict. You learn when you're uncomfortable. And I think I learned the most I've ever learned I met people who maybe just had a high school education who could work through that proofing in about two minutes and couldn't understand why I was having such a problem. I met people who knew how to roll a barrel bung up, a 550-pound barrel. They knew how many times, based on where the bung was when you, when you started, where it was going to end up. It was fascinating to see the expertise of these people. I learned that there was, at the time when I was down there, it was the early 90s, there were no computers. Do you recall? Well, you're very young, but in the 90s, there were no computers even in offices. There was one computer for the floor at Jim Beam. There were no cell phones. So if I wanted to pick up my messages from my boss or whatever, I have an 800 number on my home phone or I'd go to pay phone and call the 800 number and pick up my messages. It was bananas. That's before even pagers existed. Yeah. Well, I think the pagers existed, but I don't think I was cool enough to. <laughs> Didn't have one clipped in your hat. <laughs> yeah. I think we weren't saving lives over at Beam. So they probably thought, you know, you're selling whiskey. You can call the 800 number on the pay phone. <laughs> but um, <laughs> it was funny. We would sign out the computer in the office. It was bananas. But my point is this. There were no computers driving the distillation. There was theory, and you knew that there was a certain temperature when you were cooking the grains when you drop the rye versus when you drop the barley or if you were using a different grain. If you were making rye whiskey, there was tremendous foam that would come during fermentation and the cooking, and those were things you needed to allow for. So it was such a learning experience and, and an extraordinary time to spend with Booker. He would take me on rides in the car and he would drive because he said, I didn't know how to drive. <laughs> but the difference was, here was it. I didn't know how to drive through creeks because this guy wanted to go to the old family land. And the old family land where Jacob's well, 
1795 was where uh, Jim Beam, the family, Jacob Beam, first started making whiskey. And this was back in some forest. And I had like this huge monstrous car. It was the 90s. So it was like a Grand Marquis or something goofy. And he's like, okay, I want you to drive down that that path, which was a dirt road, and then just go through the creek. And then it's about, you know, a mile, it's the crow flies. And I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm not driving through a creek. In fact, you say, like, Get out creek. of the driver's seat. I will drive. <laughs> and he drove through the freaking creek. He did a three-point turn in the creek. In no clue. This car can take anything. This is a big car. And we went and we saw Jacob's well, and I got a chance to sit in the car with him and hear his stories of the family, hear what they did during Prohibition and how his grandfather sold the distillery because he didn't want to go to the penitentiary. He was a very, very moral man. And I have to say about Booker as well, one of the most generous people I've ever met in my whole life. He gave money to charity and would never tell anybody built that church in Bardstown, Kentucky. Well, he didn't build it, but he truly supported the uh, Basilica there. Just an amazingly generous person, both in sharing his family, sharing his legacy with me. I was allowed to be part of that family. And for the time that I worked on those brands, and it was so very, very special. I never take that for granted. I I was very, very lucky. Yeah, it definitely sounds like you have a different interview process than probably anybody's ever had during the time. And people say, oh, you get thrown from the wolves or drinking from a fire hose. You you truly lived it. I did. I, I lived, I, I drank from the fire hose and it was worth it because as I always tell my kids, as we just talked about, you learn when you're most uncomfortable That is when you force yourself to think a little bit harder. And all of those elements that now somebody with a degree in chemistry would know, these people learn. And it is instinctual. And most of the people I worked with, this is like third generation people working with the Beam family. Extraordinary folk. Watching them hand dip bottles. Now we're a little bit larger and we don't hand dip every bottle anymore. But at that time, that's what you did. And there was a table of ladies and this is what you did. You hand dipped the bottles and you crimped it. Now, I was able to sit there and do that with the ladies. Today, you couldn't do that. It's a little bit different. You know, there's there's a lot of rules about safety and unions and things that you just can't touch. But at that time, it was a family and in many ways it still is where they just bring you in and and help you to to learn with them. But part of that learning was going out in the field with Booker and selling and doing tastings. Because as I said before, this was the 90s and vodka was king, sweet flavored drinks and martinis. Remember the apple teeny? This is when the apple teeny took off. Yeah. We realized we weren't going to get where we needed to go by just advertising. I think we had already understood that you need to talk to people who talk to people because your recommendation from a friend is so much more meaningful than an ad in a paper. Somebody telling you, I like this brand, lessens that risk to buying a bottle like you, like nothing, no, no coupon could get you there. So we started a series of tastings. In our first year, we didn't have a lot of people out there, but we did uh, tastings with Booker. And the idea was Booker would tell these stories. He'd tell the stories of when there was a tornado at the distillery and how he and I believe it was Carl Beam were sitting in an office and they were tasting some of the distillate and they heard this roaring outside the window and they totally did not get that there was a tornado passing by and had taken down half of a rack house. He just sat inside, you know, sipped and sipped. The flood that flooded the Boston, Kentucky distillery and Booker had Fred bring his boat so we could bring people to and from the plant so they can keep the distillation going. The stories that he told were extraordinary and that most of the times they had nothing to do with bourbon. <laughs> it just happened to be like, but they were just, just stories yeah, part of, of it. the past. 
So we do these tastings. And and were these tastings like in person at the distillery or were you going out there in the field? And We were going in the field. We had a partnership with, I believe it was Hyatt Hotels. And we just started sending out invitations and you were allowed to bring a friend. And within, I think by 1996, we had at every tasting about 200 people. And it was that that got the renaissance of bourbon going, that got people drinking this core group of influencers that grew the bourbon business to what it is today. And I always talk with with Fred and we talk about how it was so difficult to sell whiskey in the 90s and now we can't keep it in stock. And it was just that fact of discovering what was lost. If you think about prohibition, when prohibition hit, all the distilleries, for the most part, stopped working. And post-prohibition, everybody started their distilleries up again, but they started cutting the proof on their whiskeys so that they can get it out faster. It was a little bit younger, a little bit lighter. And so we lost the truth of what whiskey was about. And that's what Booker brought back with the small batch bourbons. He brought back whiskey the way it used to be. So I, I know that sounds very trite, but if you think about it, 100 proof nine years old. 100 proof was the proof level that was considered at the turn of the century, the standard. It was bottle and bond, although bottled and bond, you have to be from one season and we weren't always from one season. So we were 100 proof, but we were nine years old, extra aged. We had bookers straight from the barrel because all the bars in the late 1800s served straight from the barrel. they there wasn't glass, especially out West. Glass was very expensive. If there was a piece of glass, you carried it with you and you filled up your bottle or your jug and then you brought it back with you. All of our packaging, even you know the bottles that are this flask shape or the, the shape of the wine bottles that Booker's was in was all about this concept that you used what you had back at the turn of the century, used what you had to fill up your jug, and it was the quality of the spirit inside that really mattered. And that was what why Booker would never change the packages. If you look at Basil Hayden, it's in like a, a white wine bottle. And I remember doing research in the 90s, and people are like, what is that? That looks like rot gut. I think I would put a plastic bag around it or a paper bag around it. And I was like, oh, Booker, we got to change this package. He's like, I'm not changing that package. You're not doing your job well enough. You need people to discover what's inside that bottle. That's what's important. It's not what's on the outside. He did not, and he rejected overly fancy bottles. He always called it too fancy to be good. He was very much a pragmatist in that sense. Do you find that a little weird today, considering like today's Basil Hayden is almost like one of the fancier bottles of the market? It's got this like copper ring around it. It's got some... Some added emblems and all this other sort of stuff? That was our answer at that time. We've had that band. In fact, the band was actually more exotic at the time when I worked on the business. It was actually a wooden band that went around and it was real copper and it kept unbuckling and poking people. So we had to kill it. <laughs> you get a free Band-Aid with, with every bottle of basil <laughs> Hayden. I was like, oh, darn it again. It happened. <laughs> So that was our answer on Basil Hayden. We tried to fancy it up. And Booker's like, you see what happens when you fancy things up? But I think we tried to explain to him that there is there is a balance. I mean, yeah, we could put these bottles in a paper bag, but that's just making it more difficult for people to discover this. Just meet us halfway. Meet me halfway. Let's make it a little bit fancier. So I am happy with where we are at today. And in fact, I'm super happy about the newest package of Knob Creek because they've gone to the wavy glass of the turn of the century. And they've gone into the pressed letters that come out of the glass of, of the brand, which uh, I, I just love. And I think it, it truly honors Booker's intention. Booker's will never change. It will always be in a wine bottle because that's what he believed in that brand. It will always be straight from the barrel, uncut, unfiltered. This is the way he liked whiskey. And in fact, he said, when my grandfather during Prohibition, he kept two barrels up in the attic in the house in Bardstown on 3rd Street. And he would go up there, fill his bottle and come downstairs. This is how his grandfather enjoyed whiskey. So he truly brings that legacy forward with Booker's bourbon. 
Do you remember about what time the box was introduced? The box was introduced. It was a closed front box. It was a light colored box. And that was probably in the late 80s. And that was part of the gifting. It was a real wood box. It was like oak box because Booker loved oak. He loved woodworking. But then when we introduced it on a broader basis in the 92, we went to a pine, a white pine box that looked like a little crate. What's really cool is you can go, when I'm watching TV shows, I was watching the guys from Top Gear. They're on some tour over in Vietnam. And there they are. And there's a box of bookers with highest grade bourbon on the back bar in Vietnam. I'm like, oh my God, I, I can't believe this this brand that was a baby in 92 and just born and something I worked on is around the world. It's, ac- it's across the world and people acknowledge it and put it on a pedestal. That is the validation of your work when you see that and you're like, oh my gosh, somebody loved this. So yeah, I saw that box. We eventually moved to a clear front because people needed to see the bottle. That's when people started to value the wine bottle. And then eventually we went to a darker color only because our spirit is so deep brown because it's straight from the barrel. It's uh, like this beautiful golden amber, nutty brown color. And the uh, the pine just wasn't giving us that sense of of true flavor. Fred, since his father died, his father died in 2004, Fred has continued to ambassador that brand and make shifts. So... I think we just did a uh, 30th anniversary with a dark oak bottle or box. I didn't even get a bottle of that. That was so rare. It was so incredible. I got to taste it. And I, of course, I posted that all over the place, but, and it was extraordinary. Oh my gosh. It was wonderful. I just wish I could have had more, you know? I'll put in a request to take care of the OGs around here. Somebody's got to, somebody's got to look after you, Kathleen. Yeah. Oh, well, don't make... Don't tell them. I mean, I've gotten a lot of really good stuff, please. <laughs> I mean, I've got the Stiller's oh. Masterpiece, the 21-year-old. You know, I'm like, oh, that's a nice one. The one we finished in port. And uh, we also created one, an 18-year-old that was finished in um, cognac casks. Oh, mm. that was good. Oh, I love cognac finished bourbons. That's Oh, my Lord. It was yeah. delicious. It seems like that's kind of been a, a new trend as of recently. A lot of these exclusive finishes and cognac is definitely up there. But I don't. I don't, want, I don't want to go too much into the, the finishing thing side of things. No, I, no. Hell, we're back at the, uh, we're with true bourbon whiskey. Yeah, right? yeah. And so another, th- you, you talked about, you know, when you started a lot of these you know, on the small batch product side, you, you mentioned Booker's a lot. Of course, Basil Hayden quite a bit as well. And if you touched on Knob Creek, where was Baker's kind of fitting into this portfolio at the time? Well, you know, I met Baker way back when. Baker Beam is... Booker's cousin. And he was the good looking cousin. He was the cousin who rode the Harley. He was the cousin that got all the girls. Booker was like six foot six and he was like a giant. And Baker was just the perfect size, truly handsome man. Baker worked at the distillery. His, I believe his father was Carl. And Carl ran that distillery for a while, ran the Jim Beam distillery for a while. And then Baker went over to move to Heaven Hill. He liked to drive. So he drove trucks for Heaven Hill. So Baker's was always there and it was always a sleeper. We do tastings and we just say, what's your favorite whiskey? And people would all raise their hand for Baker's. I'm like, well, go, go buy a bottle. It just was overshadowed by its siblings. You know, Knob Creek is that bold, true taste of whiskey the way Kentucky intended it to be. Very rich and intense. Booker's was straight from the barrel, so you chose the proof you wanted to drink it at. It was the purest form of whiskey. And Basil Hayden's was a higher rye. It was spicy, but it was super easy to drink. It was lighter, 80 proof, perfect entry level. But here was this seven years, 107 proof whiskey. And it was so close to Knob Creek, but didn't have as much age. And I think it suffered by that. But what people didn't understand was the candy-like flavor that came to it when you added just a touch of water. You know, wood adds so much tannins, and that's what gives that intense bite that people enjoy with Knob Creek, where bakers didn't have that intense bite. And I think people just, the other choices were so exotic that they just 
didn't go beyond bakers. Now we've got bakers in a single barrel. And I think that is a unique way to take bakers where it has its own drama, its own excitement. Seven years, 107 proof just while was wonderful for those who knew it, didn't give the brand the chance to be who it wanted to be. Yeah, they refreshed that, what, I think it was two years ago? Two years ago. And it's a beautiful new package. We had bakers in that same bottle that Booker's was in, and it was a wine bottle. Just FYI, Booker got wine bottles on a closeout, which is why Small Batch was all in wine bottles, with the exception of Knob Creek. I like that he little was a tidbit. very thrifty man, very thrifty. Um, but this, I think, change that they've made to bakers, I'm 100% behind because maybe people will discover the uniqueness of this brand and it'll finally become what it should have been years ago. Um, it is my one regret that we ha- we're not able to make more out of bakers. And it's like Baker Beam. He's a very understated man. If you go on YouTube and you search videos of Baker and he'll speak, he is very soft-spoken. He is a very, very kind man. He actually lived on the grounds of the distillery in the house up on the hill. Have you been to our distillery? Oh, I've been a few times. Oh, yeah. Right. So you know that T. Jeremiah Beam house up on the hill, the White House? Yeah, I think that's That's... where Fred's office is now and stuff like that. Exactly. That is where Baker grew up. Actually, do you remember the post office as you come down the road? There's a I tiny do. little one bedroom. That was the house he was born in. And then they moved up to the house on the hill. They would have lunch when they were going to the second distillation and the horn would blow. That's when Carl's wife would know to make lunch for Carl and Baker. He always tells stories of the distillery. So if you have a chance, go on to YouTube and look up some of those videos because he tells some very interesting stories, especially about during Prohibition, which is when his family was on that land. Absolutely. So do you remember in the early days of trying to promote a lot of these whiskeys and going to these tastings, what those price points were and how you try to stay like aggressive in the market and try to compete against clear spirits? If you're anything like me, then you can't get enough about bourbon. And that's why I'm a subscriber to Bourbon Plus magazine. Bourbon Plus is a quarterly publication that tells the stories from the heart of bourbon, the farmers who grow the grain, the distillers who labor over the process, and the people like you and me who raise their glasses to celebrate it all. Subscribe to Bourbon Plus magazine today at bourbonplus.com, that's P-L-U-S dot com, and use code PURSUIT at checkout for $5 off your subscription. Shopify's already taken the cash register online, helping millions sell billions around the world. But did you know that Shopify can do the same thing at your retail store? Give your point of sale system a serious upgrade with Shopify. Shopify's point of sale is your command center for your retail store. From accepting payments to managing inventory, Shopify has everything you need to sell in person. And with Shopify, you get a powerhouse selling partner that effortlessly unites your in-person and online sales into one source of truth. Track every sale across your business in one place and know exactly what's in stock. Connect with customers in line and online. Shopify helps you drive store traffic with plug and play tools built for marketing campaigns from TikTok to Instagram and beyond. And get hardware that fits your business. Take payments by smartphone, transform your tablet into a point of sale system, or use Shopify's point of sale Go Mobile device for a battle tested solution. Plus, Shopify's award winning 24 7 help is there to support your success every step of the way. Do retail right with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash bourbon, all lowercase, and go to shopify.com slash bourbon to take your retail business to the next level today. Shopify.com slash bourbon. Do you remember in the early days of trying to promote a lot of these whiskeys and going to these tastings, what those price points were and how you try to say like aggressive in the market and try to compete against clear spirits? Yeah, people thought we were insane. A $50 bottle of whiskey for Booker's was bananas. Obviously now Booker's is so much more expensive than that. And that's because we just don't have enough. Plus 30 years of inflation. You know, I think we can probably put that to it. Yeah, happen. Right. And we just haven't continued making more of it. It is very expensive to make. 
But yeah, people thought we were bananas with the $50. And that's why I went out and hand sold and why the tastings were so important. This was the first time we really broke a $25 price point and over $20. I mean, expensive whiskey at that time was $19.99. Knob Creek got up at $25. Basil Hayden was, I think, at $30. And Baker's was at $38. Now, obviously, they're all well above 30 and 40, 50 and upwards of 90. So it has grown, but the barrier at that time was just a mindset. Consumers just had never spent that much on whiskey. Now, Maker's Mark had started to come out with a more expensive whiskey at this time. You know, Maker's Mark was really a regional, very strong regional brand. I think upper teens, maybe in the early 20s, uh, $20 price point. And they were starting to grow in markets like Kentucky. So they helped us. The other brand that helped us was Blanton's. Great, great whiskey. Love those little horses on the top of the bottle. My son actually collects them because he sells Blanton's. I'm going to quick question you right there real quick. So the first time you saw Blanton's, what did you think when you saw those horse stoppers? I loved it. I mean, I, I wished, I'm like, this would allow us to sell a $50 bottle of whiskey, Booker. Oh, well, that's not the way we work. (laughs) <laughs> it's just not the way it is. I mean, I, I think he truly was one of these old fashioned people that felt that you need pain to get to gain. And just the whole, while he loved the Blanton's bottle and didn't dislike the product, he didn't believe in that too fancy to be good. He didn't comment on a lot of people's whiskey with the exception of wild Turkey. He was very good friends with Jimmy Russell until his death. And he really felt that Wild Turkey was a, was a great whiskey. So he would talk about that and he would talk with Jimmy and they would do panels together. That was special to him. But outside of that, uh, he never, t- he never said anything bad about anybody, but he just didn't believe in fancy packaging. Just thought it was unnecessary and a, a waste of money. I'm kind of curious about like what you thought when you first saw it, or is it kind of one of those moments of, oh, damn it, I wish we would have thought of something like that. Oh, yeah. Oh, hellfire. Yes. I wish we would have. I mean, the collectible tops, my son continues to look for the different horses so he can get his full collection. And the good news was, is that we eventually, well, we never would get to that point because that's what Blanton's owns. It's special. We started to do the vintages of Booker's. And allow people to select their batch, kind of like my batch, where you can build a taste. Because people don't understand the variety of taste that is available, even when you're taking a batch from a set of barrels. And so that has allowed us to have some kind of uniqueness. And maybe the names are different. And we're not we're not about the thing. We're about the concept. So with Blanton's, it was all about those, those horses. And I think being truer to who we are, yeah, of course I would have loved that, but it's just not who we are as an organization, or at least Jim Beam isn't. We are understated and we are about what's in the bottle. And Fred continues that discussion to this day. I think he would feel uncomfortable with a fancy bottle. And if you look at Little, little Book, have you talked with little Fred yet? Oh, yeah. We've had Freddie on the show a few times. We've talked yeah, about little book yeah. quite, a, quite a bit. So, you know, the, that little book is still in that wine bottle of his grandfather's. So he honors that tradition of, of what's inside that counts. And I guess I, I want to kind of talk about the, the batches as well. So and I guess also kind of guide me as, as part of your, your career here, too. So we're in the 90s. You're helping promote a lot of the small batch bourbons. Were you also there when Booker's was introducing the different batch numbers and the all of the kind of ways that you can label it and stuff like that too? Yeah. I was on the small batch bourbons and super premium brands. My my remit extended to they actually included a vodka in my portfolio, a scotch, a tequila, two tequilas, Chinaco El Tesoro, a scotch, the Dalmore if you remember the Dalmore, mm-hmm. and a Canadian whiskey called Tangle Ridge. And these were called small brands or seed brands. I worked on that business for 14 years until the day Booker died. The day he died, I was moved off that business and I was moved into an integration role. Our company had been, our sales force 
was starting to sell Absolute. And so we had split our sales from our marketing. And so I was working an integration role to bring the the sales force who was now selling Absolute and our portfolio, along with our marketing team from Jim Beam, to bring that all together. So I moved into that role. And shortly after that, I went into brand education. And so I ran the education for brands like De Kuyper, which has a fascinating history, Lafroig, Maker's Mark, Cavoisier, Crucian Rum. So I took the knowledge that I learned with Booker and I learned the other categories as well. And that's how I got into Keepers of the Quay. That's how I got into driving knowledge of, of Scotch. So about the time, I think it was the late 2000s, when I was also leading the ambassador team. And these ambassadors would go around the United States and help drive advocacy for our brands. And Adam Harris was a person who worked on this small batch bourbons and Jim Beam. And he came up with this concept of creating batches and naming those batches. The brand team loved it. And we went from there. Fred loved it. Fred loved the way that it could honor people. It could honor situations, whether it's the oven buster batch uh, his mother used to forever baste with bookers and blow the oven door open. Probably if you've had Fred on here, you'd know he'd tell that story. That's why we have an explicit rating. <laughs> That's right. So Adam did that. And that was late 2000s, probably, you know, 2010 and about and on. It's been a journey. I continue to work together with all of the brands, but move to the on-premise and run the on-premise business with a team of about 80 people. And, and that's when I was inducted into the Bourbon Hall of Fame in 2015, when I was running that business. So a super amazing experience. So that's going to wrap up part one of my interview with Kathleen D. Benedetto. Make sure you stick around next week for part two, when we talk about her own successes in the industry, from going on the road and leading bourbon tastings herself to eventually having her own batch of bookers named after her. Well, cheers, everyone. <laughs>